there are people that talk about the, the, a light. There are people that talk about floating above. There are people that talk about a feeling of warmth and love. I didn't feel any of that. I felt none of that. I felt untold terror. When I came to, Dr. Allen said my hair was literally standing on the end. It was an incredible experience to see that there is life uh, beyond life. Everyday people like you and me, living their lives one minute and the next they lay dying, having never known or believed the message of salvation. They traveled from this world to one beyond, but what they found was pure terror. They returned, and these are their true stories. It's very easy to be an atheist when you're successful, but it's very difficult to be an atheist when you're laying on your deathbed. Tonight, renowned cardiologist and author, Dr. Maurice Rawlings, takes you on a journey few have ever spoken of. So I called out into the darkness, Jesus, please save me. And that you could either go to heaven or you'll go to hell, and there ain't nothing else. Hear the voice of one that has heard the screams this may be your only chance to safely go to hell and back. This is an experiment on life after death. All through history, man has predicted life after death. All Bibles are based on life after death, all religions. But where are they? Who's come back to show us there's life after death? But now, through modern resuscitation methods, bringing the heart back, bringing breathing back, you and I can now bring a whole population of people back to talk to us about what's on the other side of death. See what you believe in some of these cases that we're going to present. The good ones are a dime a dozen because people love to tell about this wonderful experience after I died and I came back. The hell experiences are embarrassing. It's an F on the report card, a slap in the face. But we have some cases we're going to present tonight that tell you about their own hell experiences so that you won't go where they went. Now, what all this is based upon is teaching you, which we will later in the program, how to restart the heart, restart breathing on someone who has recently clinically died. Notice that death is reversible. You have four minutes survival time of the brain cells without blood flow before rigor mortis sets in, true death sets in, where resurrection is required, something man can't do. We can do resuscitation, something God has permitted us to do. And how many hell experiences have had salvation on the floor, conversion on the floor, and only remember the good experiences to report? Such was not the case in Ronald Reagan. He had his little boy with him, was going to a 7-Eleven store, and got in an argument, a bottle was broken, he became stabbed multiple times by his assailant, and then the rest of the story we're going to present to you on film. In 1972, my life was uh, broken. I was uh, a drug addict. I was uh, a criminal. My family was broken. My wife had filed for divorce a couple of times. My children were afraid of me. I really couldn't hold a job. My mental state was terrible. And it was in that uh, frame of life that I took my six-year-old son one night and went down to a little market 
going inside to purchase some things. And on the way in to that market, I met a gentleman coming out the door and an argument erupted. And uh, before I knew it, I had just hit him, knocked him down. And he fell into a, a stack of bottles. The bottles bursted. And uh, immediately he leaped up with a broken bottle and began to stab at me. I lifted my left arm to try to stop the, the blow and the bottle actually severed the biceps muscle, the uh, major arteries in my arm and I was bleeding to death in a, just a matter of seconds. But full of anger and hatred and rage, I kept fighting and kept bleeding. My little son was screaming, he was hysterical, but the man that ran the store came over and said, if, if you don't get to a hospital, you'll bleed to death in just a few minutes. So he actually took me in my own automobile to the hospital, and when we entered the emergency room, I was barely conscious. And as the uh, medical attendants began to work on me, I could hear their voices. And I could hear them saying, we can't help him. He'll have to be transported to another hospital. Probably will lose the arm. And as they loaded me into an ambulance, my wife had arrived by that time and got in the ambulance with me. But as they pulled out of the parking lot of that hospital, a young paramedic looked down into my face and I could barely see him, I was so weak. But he said, sir, you need Jesus Christ. And I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know what he was talking about. So my reaction to that was to begin cursing. And uh, again, he stated to me, you need Jesus. And as he was talking to me, it, it appeared like the ambulance literally exploded in flames. I, I thought it had actually blown up. It filled with smoke. And immediately I was moving through that smoke as if through a tunnel. And after some period of time coming out of the smoke and out of the darkness, I began to hear the voices of a multitude of people screaming and groaning and crying. But as I looked down, the sensation was looking down upon a, a, a volcanic opening and seeing fire and smoke and, and people inside of this burning place screaming and crying. They were burning, but they weren't burning up. They weren't being consumed. And then the sensation of moving downward into this. He was thrashing, just thrashing about, you know, and moaning and groaning. And it was like there was a battle going on. I wasn't a Christian at the time, and I didn't even know anything about spiritual battles. But it was scary to me in the fact that I could feel it. I could feel it was like light and darkness. It was like he was fighting against something. And I didn't know what, but now I know. You know it was, he was seeing the vision of hell. But, but the most terrible part of it, I began to recognize many of the people that I was seeing in these flames, as if a close-up lens on a camera was bringing their faces close to me. I could, I could see their features and see the agony and the pain and the frustration. And a number of them began to call my name and said, Ronnie, don't come to this place. There's no way out. There's no escape. If you come here, there's no way out. And I looked into the faces of of one that had died in a robbery attempt, who had been shot to death and bled to death on the sidewalk. And I looked in the face of two others that had died drunk in an automobile accident. And I looked into the face of others that had died of drug overdoses that we had partied together and, and the agony and the pain. But I believe the most painful part of it was the loneliness. And the depression was so heavy that there was no hope. There was no escape. 
there was no way out of this place. And the smell was like uh, sulfur, like an electric welder. And the, the stench was, was terrible. And as I looked at this, I had seen people killed. I had been involved in fights where people were killed. I've done time in prison for manslaughter myself. I grew up basically in a reform school and in a jail cell. I was beat on mercifully as a child by a father that had temper problems and alcohol problems. I was a runaway at 12 years old and I felt like there was nothing in this world that could frighten me. My life was wrecked, my marriage was wrecked, my health was wrecked, but now I'm seeing something that literally scares me to death because I don't understand it. And as I'm looking into this, this pit, this place of fire and screams and, and torment, I just fade out into blackness. And when I open my eyes, I'm in a hospital room in Knoxville, Tennessee. My wife is sitting by. There have been uh, multiple stitches put in my body. My arm was spared. Uh, there was almost a hundred stitches. And I, I looked in the face of my wife and I wasn't concerned about where I was or anything around me. All I could visualize was what I had just seen. He had this funny look on his face and it was a terrifying look. And he said, he said, I don't really know what's happened to me, but he said, I've been in a terrible place. And I kept telling him, you're in the hospital. You've, you've been in the hospital all along. And he kept saying, no, he said, I've been in another place. He said, he said, I don't know exactly what it was, but he said it was terrible. It's a terrible place. I could still hear the screams. I could still smell the terrible smell. I could still feel the heat and I could still hear the voices of people that I'd known through the years screaming for me to go back. And through the days to come, I tried every way to get that out of my mind. I tried to get drunk, I could not get drunk. I tried to get stoned, I could not get stoned. I tried everything that I could to get this off my mind and I could not. One morning, several months later, I, I came home to where my wife was. I'd been trying to get drunk, I couldn't. And when I walked in the house, went back to the bedroom, the light was burning. My wife was sitting up in bed and she had a large book open on her lap. And she looked up at me and her face was literally shining. And she said, Ronnie, Tonight, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. And she didn't have to say a lot to me. Our life had been filled with, with agony. She grew up in Chicago. Her father was a bartender on the south side of Chicago. She knew nothing about God or church or religion. And the pain in her face, the wrinkles that I'd put in her face with abuse, and violence and alcoholism and drug addiction, being gone for months at a time and her and the kids not knowing where I was. Her face had changed. The wrinkles were literally gone. The smile had replaced the sorrow and agony. And she looked at me and she said, Jesus, save me tonight. And she said, would you go with me and hear about this man called Jesus? And I thought for a second, and I thought, I've tried everything else in life. Nothing has worked for me. The people that I love most of all, my wife and my children, I'm, I'm terrible to them. And I agreed to go with her. And a couple of weeks later on a Sunday morning, a matter of fact, the date was November the 2nd, 1972, just before 12 o'clock a.m., a minister stood to, to read from the Bible. I was sitting in the back of the building. I didn't know anything out of the Bible. 
I did not know how to act in church. But the minister stood to read from the Bible, and he read from the Gospel of John. And he began to read these words that said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. When he said the Lamb, he had my attention. It wouldn't have meant anything to me, any other passage. But when he mentioned the Lamb, he had this hard-hearted sinner's attention. Because when I was nine years old, a very poor child in the mountains of eastern Tennessee, with a father that only knew anger and, and abuse and alcohol, a neighbor had given me a baby lamb. And I had to walk two miles to catch the school bus. And coming through her yard, she stopped me one day and said, Son, I have a gift for you. And she showed me this baby lamb. And I took that lamb home with me. It was my friend, the only friend I felt like I had. And it was uh, such a friend in days and weeks to come, it, it followed me and it would, it would meet me when I got off the school bus and came walking through the woods and the fields. One evening as I came in, the lamb was missing. And I heard my father cursing and screaming, and I looked up to the side of the house, and there he was working on, on an old model car, changing a flat tar by hand the old way. And I tried to walk around because I didn't want to be cursed, and I tried to, to bypass him. And when I got on the other side of the car, I looked down, and there was my lamb with blood all over the white wool and a tar tool sticking in its body. The lamb had come around just wanting to be curious. And in a drunken fit of anger, my father had plunged the tire iron through that lamb's body. And when I saw my lamb, my friend, dead, I began to scream as a nine-year-old child. I run into the woods screaming, he's killed my lamb. He's killed the lamb. And at nine years old, hatred and violence took my life, possessed my life. And from that point, I was never, never, ever the same. By 12 years old, I was a runaway. I was in the juvenile system, arrested time after time after time. There was no respect for authority. I hated anyone that represented authority over me. And by the time I was 15 years old, I had been in jail for car theft, for stealing. And at 15 years old, I was sentenced for manslaughter, involved in a car accident that had taken life and crippled others for life wondering at that time if life ever would hold anything for me. But when that minister mentioned the lamb, he had my attention. And he said, Jesus Christ is God's lamb. And he died and he shed his blood that whosoever will could have a new start, could be forgiven, could start over. That morning, as I stood to try to leave the building, I thought, I don't want anybody to see me cry. I've not cried since I was nine years old. I'm not afraid of any living thing on this earth, and no one's going to see me cry. But I turned to leave, but I started down the aisle toward the front of that building. And my prayer was this. I didn't know the sinner's prayer. I didn't know the Roman road of salvation, but my prayer was this, God, if you exist, and Jesus, if you are God's lamb, please, please kill me or cure me. I don't want to live anymore. I'm not a husband. I'm not a father. I'm no good. And at that instant, 
It was like the darkness and the blackness left my life and the tears began to flow. And for the first time since I was nine years old, the tears did run and the guilt left my life and the violence and the anger and the hatred left my life and Jesus Christ became Lord and Savior of my life that morning. And since that time, I didn't know what would happen, but God healed my mind, my memory. The drug addiction, the alcoholism was instantaneously gone, delivered. And from that moment, I knew that I had to tell the story of what had happened to me. My life was only spared to tell others about the place that I had seen and the hope of Jesus Christ to save mankind from this terrible fate. Here we are again wondering whether hell is for the bad guys or the good guys. I'd like to introduce the subjects O-B-E-N-D-E. -E. You know what clinical death is, where heart stops, breathing stops, and we start life again, restart the breathing in the heart. They come from death back to life, a reversible situation before rigor mortis sets in. Out of the body experiences and near death experiences are entirely different. Near death experience, I hold a gun up at you and say, give me your money. You may get scared to death, but that's a near death experience, but you didn't come anywhere near dying almost near crash auto accident. That's a near death experience, but nothing involving stopping the heart, stopping breathing. And yet uh, most of the authors that write this books are including NDEs and OBEs with clinical death. We're just investigating clinical death where people actually die and come back. Now, out of the body experiences is a way to get there without dying. How'd you like to find out what death feels like without dying? Well, deep hypnosis can get you there. You see your guru over in India and learn the meditation techniques and the correct mantra. Uh, you can have uh, chemical hypnosis. You can go scrying with your crystal ball. Uh, you can have kundalini the electrical stimulus of the coiled snake down the base of the spine, the, the chakral sites and all of the acupuncture is based upon uh, ways of getting out of the body to experience life beyond the body, separating spirit from the body. Uh, this is the definition in the Bible, when the spirit separates from the body, but they're talking about a permanent separation, not a man-made separation. And we, in turn, are talking nothing about NDEs or OBEs. We're talking about clinical death. And this is where the great majority of the people that have true experiences occur. One of the cases we're going to show tonight is uh, Charles McCaig a 57-year-old mail carrier <clears throat> who was having chest pain. We took him to the office, put him on a treadmill, and started the treadmill until he got his chest pain again. He was attached to an EKG. The EKG went haywire. We knew he had chest pain. Before we could stop the machine, he dropped dead. Unfortunate, only one in 5,000 do that, so don't be afraid of EKG stress test. But when he dropped dead, he had a very peculiar situation. Uh, he convulsed like most people do when they first die and the heart stops supplying blood to the brain. Eyes rolled up, sputtered, turned blue, stopped breathing. The nurse started IV, I started external heart massage. The strangest thing happened when I would stop resuscitating to put in a pacemaker. When I came to, Dr. Allen said my hair was literally standing on the end and my eyes had already started dilating. And uh, I was absolutely, uh, just absolutely scared to death. I was horrified. My life was what you might call normal. I partied lots, not all that bad, but I had joined the church at a small, young age because my parents had said, 
let's go down to the front and join the church. I really didn't realize what it was to belong to a church or accept Christ until that day. And I had early in one morning at work, I had gone to the, walked to the local clinic in, in my hometown and, tell, and, and telling them I thought I was having a heart attack. I didn't tell anyone I was going and they sent me on up to the clinic where Dr. Rollins was and kept me about three or four days and then gave me a stress test. On that stress test, I told the girl Pam that was running the stress test uh, that uh, I was dying, let me off, and that's the last I remember of that. And uh, when I came to, uh, Dr. Rollins was giving a CPR and he asked me what was the matter because I was looking so scared and so forth. And uh, I had told him I'd been to hell, I needed help. And he said, well, keep your health to yourself. I'm a doctor, I'm trying to save your life. You need a minister for that. As he was giving me CPR, he was trying to install a pacemaker with the other hand and do it with one. I would fade out. And then he'd start again and bring me back. I watched what was going on like some people say I was floating in the air or up on the ceiling. I was up above it and could look down and see things. And I kept asking, please help me, please help me. I don't want to go back to hell. And Pam said, well, he needs help do something. And at that time, he said, say this short prayer after me. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He'll save my soul and keep me alive. I'll be on the hook for you forever. And if I die, please keep me out of hell. And after that, the other experiences was real pleasant. I saw my stepmother, my mother. My mother passed away when I was about five months old. I never saw a photograph of her. And I was able to recognize who she was. And my stepmother had passed away approximately 10 years before. They were together. They were they, I did not have any contact physically or mentally with them. All I remember was they kept their hands outreached to me. And I remember later that I made a remark that I'd always heard it, but uh, now I knew it. And Dr. Rollins asked me, what did I mean? And I said, well, I've always heard you couldn't carry your money with you. And I looked and they didn't have pockets. I know that's weird, but I was trying to take in everything I could see. I must have thought I was going to get back so I could tell it. And after I saw them, my next experience was walking down a lane that had colors on both sides, just brilliant colors. I have dabbled in art, and I, or Rembrandt, either one could not reproduce re those colors. They were so bright. This light surrounded me. And I believe to this day that was the Holy Spirit that surrounded me and took care of me. And I've never felt so good and so safe in all my life. After all this was over, I realized what had really happened. It was a double conversion. Not only had this make-believe prayer converted this atheist on the floor, it had also converted this atheist doctor that it was working on him. That's the only reason I can appear to you here now, to tell you that there is a life after death, and it ain't all good. Most of you viewers out there can tell the difference between simple fainting, clinical death, and biologic death. Charles McCaig, take that case for example, who was on the treadmill. I could tell that he was in clinical death. He had a startled question on his face. He was about to ask the question. He looked dumbfounded at me as he's walking on the treadmill. I noticed his heart had stopped, his breathing had stopped, but he was still walking and talking for a minute or two before no brain to the blood, blood flow to the brain registered and he dropped dead. Uh, he was dead and didn't even know it. I should have told him, but what did he do? As soon as we started the clinical uh, death treatment, CPR, we started the heart up again, started breathing again, he came back. This was a case of clinical death. Now, biologic death would have occurred if 
four to six minutes time had intervaled between stoppage of heartbeat supplying the brain and breathing stoppage. After that, brain cells, as the most sensitive cells in the body, start dying. Rigor mortis sets in, meaning stiff as a board, and now we need the resurrection. Only God can do a resurrection. We're doing resuscitation, something we're permitted to do. And now we want to introduce to you Howard Storm, an art and literary professor who was in Paris with his class when he suddenly had a stomach rupture an ulcer rupture, peritonitis, shock, sudden death, clinical death, resuscitation, hell experience. I was a 38-year-old college professor and I taught art and I had taken a group of students and my wife and we had gone around Europe and we had just done a three-week tour and this was the next to the last day and we were in Paris and at 11 o'clock in the morning, I had um, a perforation of my stomach. When this happened, the pain was the most acute pain I'd ever experienced in my life, and it just dropped me right down to the ground. And so I'm twisting and kicking and moaning and screaming and yelling around on the floor. And my wife called an emergency, called the desk, and they called an emergency service. A doctor came and. He called an ambulance because he knew what was wrong, and they took me about eight miles across town to the public hospital, to the General Hospital of Paris, where I was taken into emergency, examined by two more doctors who knew exactly what was wrong with me, and then they took me away to the surgery hospital, which was a couple of blocks away. And I was parked there because there wasn't any surgeon available to do the surgery, and so there I lay for um, eight to ten hours in that hospital with no medication, no examination, no attention whatsoever, awaiting a surgeon to come to give me this operation that was critical. And it's now 8.30 at night. The nurse came in and said that they were very sorry they weren't able to get a doctor for me and they'd get one the next day. Well, when she said that, I knew that it was over for me. I knew that I was dead. The only thing that was keeping me alive was I didn't want to die. I was scared to death of dying because as far as I knew, I was an atheist, non-believer, person who lived for their, the gratification they could get out of the moment. And you know, like dying to me was like the worst I mean, next to the pain, dying was the worst thing that could happen to you because it's the end of life and there was no more. There wasn't anything else. But when she said that, the idea of trying to exist for another minute, another hour in this pain, it wasn't worth it anymore. I'd been hanging on in the hopes that they told me that they'd get a doctor and do the surgery and open me up and, and fix the problem inside of me. But when they said they couldn't get one, so I said to my wife, it's time for us to say goodbye because I'm going to die now. And she got up and she put her arms around me and lying on the bed and she told me how much she loved me and I told her how much I loved her. And this makes me really sad. And um, we made our goodbyes, you know, said those things that you'd say to the, we'd been married 20 years, say all those kinds of things. I can't tell you because I'll just start crying, but um, she finally sat down because she knew it was over. And I knew. And it was just so hard looking at her, crying like that, and I just closed, closed my eyes, just let it go, and I went unconscious. I probably was unconscious for a very short while, a few minutes probably. And I was conscious again. And I looked, opened my eyes and looked, and I was standing up next to my bed. And I knew exactly where I was and what the situation was. I mean, there was no confusion in my mind. I felt um, more alive, more real than I've ever felt in my life. You know, people ask me, you know, were you a ghost? I was, the I was just the opposite, very alive. 
as I'm looking around the room, I see that there's underneath the sheet on the bed, there's something under the sheet, a body. And so I bent over the bed, the head was turned away from me, and I looked at the face, and it looked like me. But that wasn't possible because I was standing there, I'm alive, I'm great, you know. I mean, I'm more than great, I'm like, you know. And so I tried to talk to my wife. Can't you hear me? And Can't you hear me? You know, she couldn't hear me or That's see me. That's not me! But I thought What's going on that here? she just was ignoring me. So I got very angry at her for ignoring me for not paying attention to me. And I'm screaming and yelling at her, what's going on here? Why, why is this body in the bed that looks like me and how to get there and stuff like that? And I was thinking suspicion that the body in the bed was me, but I didn't want to think about that because that was too scary. So I'm getting really agitated and upset because this is all too weird. You know, this can't be happening, it's impossible. Um, I've got a hospital gown on and it's like really, everything's really real. And, I hear people calling me outside the room and they're saying to me in soft, gentle voices, Howard, you gotta come with us now. Come quickly, come out here. So I go over to the doorway of the room and there's people out in the hallway and they're, um, uh, the hallway's dank, it's gray. It's not, it's not light or dark, it's just gray. And they're all in grayness and they're men and women and what they're wearing might possibly be hospital uniforms. Um, and I asked them if they were from the doctor to take me to the operation. And I told them, I said, I'm really sick and I'm going to have an operation and I'm going to die if I don't get this operation. And I was supposed to have the operation eight hours ago. And I'm telling them all this stuff. And they're going, well, you know, we know, we know, we understand. Howard, you know, you got to come, come quickly. Howard, come Howard, quickly. Howard, come, Howard, come out here. here. Howard, come quickly. Come with us. Howard, we've been waiting for you, waiting. I Wait. left the room, which was real clear, bright, and went into the hallway, which was dank and hazy, and um, followed these people. We had a very long journey. There's no, there's no time, and whenever I make a reference to time, <laughs> it's just an illusion because there was no time in this place. But this journey, if I were to recreate it, I'd have to walk for like from Nashville to Louisville or something to, to recreate the, the walk with these people. And as we walked, they stayed around me and kept moving me on and it kept getting darker and darker. Um, they were becoming more and more openly hostile to me. First they were sort of syrupy sweet to get me to go with them, and then when I was going along with them, it was like, hurry up, keep moving, you know, shut up, stop asking questions, you know, they started getting more um, ugly. And so we get into complete darkness, and I'm absolutely terrified. These people are very hostile, I don't know where I am. I said, I'm not gonna go with you any further. They said, um, you're almost there and we started to fight. I, just, I was trying to get away from them. They were pushing and pulling at me. And um, there are now a lot of them. What originally had been like a handful, now was, since it was darkness, probably made hundreds or thousands. I, don't, I mean, I have no idea. And they're playing with me. You know, clearly they could have just destroyed me if they wanted to. They didn't want to destroy me. What they wanted to do was they wanted to inflict pain on me because they derived, pleasure isn't the right word, but they derived, derived satisfaction out of the pain that I experienced. So what they were doing in the beginning part was, it's real hard for me to talk about and I don't, and I'm not gonna tell you much about it, just a little bit. Because um, it gets, I mean, just gets too ugly. Uh, but the, initially they were like tearing and biting, um, tearing with their fingernails, scratching, gouging, ripping, and then uh, biting. Uh, trying to defend myself, trying to fight them off, trying to get away from them, but there's, it's like being um, in a beehive just hundreds of them all over me. And I eventually was just laying on the ground there, all ripped up, um, 
pain everywhere, inside, outside. And even harder to bear than the physical pain was the emotional pain of what had just happened to me. The utter degradation that I just experienced. You know, I never once felt that it was uh, unjust or wrong. I heard my voice. It wasn't somebody else's voice. It wasn't the voice of God or anything. It was my voice. And I heard it speak, but I didn't speak it. So whether it's the voice of my conscience or I don't know what it was. It was just, but I distinctly heard my voice say, pray to God. And so I thought to myself, I don't believe in God. I pray to God. And I'm thinking, even if I could pray, I don't know how to pray anymore. I haven't prayed. And at that time, I probably hadn't prayed in 22, 23 years. So. So I'm thinking, like, when, when, when I was a child and we said prayers in Sunday school and we said prayers in church, and what did we say? And I'm trying to think of it. I'm trying to think of it because the, to me, to pray was to recite something that I'd learned. That's what, it, that's what I thought a prayer was then. So I'm, let's say, the Lord is my shepherd. Um, give us this day our daily bread. My country, tis of thee. No, that's not a prayer. That's wrong. Um, Let's see, yea, though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, four score and seven years ago, our forefathers. You know, I'm getting all of them mixed up. I can't remember how to pray. And then the people who were around me, if I, every time I'd like mention God, these people who had attacked me and beaten me, every time I'd mention God, it was as if mentioning God was throwing boiling water on them. They would shriek, they would scream, they would yell, and in, worst profanity that, than anything I've ever heard in this world. The other thing that was happening was that they, they um, couldn't bear to be around me talking about God. It was, so, it was so painful for them to hear about God that they kept backing away, backing away, backing away. And so I had a sense that I could push them away by talking about God. And so I'm trying to remember prayers and I'm getting all confused and mixed up and it was just all um, crazy. and. I'm lying there and eventually I realize that they're gone and I'm alone. Now I was alone there for an eternity and what I mean by that was um, absolutely no sense of time to, but I thought about my life, thought about what I'd done and what I hadn't done. I thought about the situation I was in and this the conclusion that I came to was is that I had lived an entirely, my adult life, I had lived a selfish life. My only God in my adult life was myself. I realized that I was, um, you know, something terribly, terribly wrong with my life and that the people that attacked me were the same kind of people that I was. They were not me monsters, they weren't demons. They were people who had missed it. The, p the point of being born and being alive in this world. They'd missed it and they'd lived lives of selfishness and cruelty. And now we're in a world where there was nothing else. There was nothing but selfishness and cruelty and they were doomed to inflict that upon each other and upon themselves uh, probably forever and ever and ever and ever without end. Um, and now I was a part of it. And it seemed like, although I didn't want to be there, it seemed like probably the right place for me to be. There was a sense of like, this is what I deserve, because this is what I lived. You can't imagine how emotionally painful that was. And I'm lying there for time without end, thinking about my fate, and in the back of my mind comes up an image of myself as a child sitting in a Sunday school classroom singing, Jesus loves me. I could hear in my mind, Jesus loves me, la, la, la. Jesus loves me, la, la. And as I recalled myself singing it and heard my, I could hear myself as a child singing it. 
more important than anything else was that I could feel it in my heart that there was a time in my life when I was young and innocent, when I believed in something good, when I believed in something other than myself, when I believed in someone who was all good, all powerful, who really, really cared about me. And I knew that I wanted that back, that which I had lost, that I'd thrown away, that I'd betrayed. I, want, I wanted that back. That I didn't know Jesus, but I wanted to know Jesus. I didn't know his love, but I wanted to know his love. I didn't, I didn't know if he was real, but I wanted him to be real. You know, I mean, it was, this was all just because I trusted that there was a time in my life that I had believed in something and that um, I knew, I had known once as a child that it was true and I wanted to trust that it was true. So I called out Jesus. into the darkness, Jesus, please save me. Please save me. And he came. He came. At first there was a tiny little speck of light in the darkness and very rapidly got bright. And the light became so bright that if it were in this world, it would have, it would have consumed me. It, it, it just would have fried me to a crisp. But it wasn't at all hot or dangerous there. The light just came upon me. And he reached down. He was in this light. And he reached down out of this light and gently started to pick me up. And in his light, I could see that I was gore and filth and wounds all over. And was, I looked like roadkill. And he's gently putting his hands underneath me and, and very tenderly picking me up. And as he's touching me, everything just goes away. All the wounds, all the pain, all the dirt, just, uh, just kind of like um, evaporated away. And I'm like whole and healed. And inside, uh, filled with his love, which I wish I could be more articulate about. It's so frustrating not being able to tell people about it because, you know, it's the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. I mean, it's, it's like the, it's the everything. You know, it's the all of, of life is to know that love. And, you know, I get to it and I just can't describe it. I can't convey it to you. So he's holding me and embracing me, rubbing my back like a father would his son, like a mother would her daughter, just gently rubbing my back. And I'm bawling like a baby, out of happiness. I mean, like the, the, the release, the, you know, having been lost and now been found, having been dead and now brought back to life, you know. And he's carrying me out of there. Up, we just go. Out, go on. And we're moving towards a world of light, and uh, I began to have thoughts of tremendous shame that I've been so bad. And so I'm, I thought of myself as dirt, garbage, filth. And I thought to myself, he's made a mistake. I don't belong here. He doesn't want me. You know, it's like the shame. Like, how could he? How could he care about me? You know, why me? Um, I'm bad. And we stopped. We weren't in hell. We weren't in heaven. We were in between. And we stopped. And he said, "We don't make mistakes. You belong here." And we began to converse, and he was talking and telling me things, and he brought over some angels, and we went over my life from beginning to end. And what they wanted to show me in my life was what I had done right and what I had done wrong. And without going through my whole life story, it was real simple, real simple. When I had been a loving, kind person, 
considerate of other people. It made the angels happy, it made Jesus happy, and they let me know that it made God happy. And when I had um, been selfish and manipulative, it made the angels unhappy, it made Jesus unhappy, and they let me know that it made God unhappy. Uh, what they were trying to convey to me, in a nutshell, was my whole purpose of my existence had been to love God, love my neighbor as myself. That's why I had been created. That's what I was in this world to, um, do, <coughs> to do and to learn, and I had failed. They told me that I had to come back to this world, and I got real upset because I wanted to go to heaven. What they told me about heaven, it's like the most fun, most interesting. I mean, it's the most wonderful place. You, I mean, everybody, every, everybody would want you know want to go to heaven, and I wanted to get there. And they said that I wasn't ready, I wasn't fit, that it wasn't my time to go to heaven. It was my time to come back to this world and try and live the way that God wanted me to live, the way God had created me to live in the first place. I told them, Jesus and the angels, that I couldn't live in this world without them. And I said that I would have, my heart would break to send me back to this world. Because they were, they'd be there and I'd be here. And they said to me, you, you don't get it? You don't get it? What is the matter? We were trying to, we were showing you all this, we would explain to you. We've always been there. We're all, we always have been there. We've always been with you all this time. And don't, you've never been alone down there? And I said, you've got to, you've got to let me know that you're around once in a while. So they said, if I prayed and confessed my sins to God, and gave, gave what I had, and, and they meant, what they meant by what I had was gave my worries, my cares, my hopes, my dreams, just gave it all up to God. That there would be times when they would be there and I would know in my heart that they were there. I wouldn't necessarily see them or hear them, but I would, I would, I would feel the love like I'd felt it then. And I said, if you will assure me that there are times when I can know that love, I could live in this world. And I said that they would do that, and with that they sent me back. After the experience, the uh, nurse who had been in the room a few minutes before and said they couldn't find a doctor and they tried to get one the next time. She came running back to the room and she said a doctor's arrived at the hospital, which was like this is all pretty miraculous stuff because this is now like um, 9.30 at night, around 9, 9.30 at night. She said a doctor's arrived at the hospital and we're going to have uh, do surgery on you right away. And some orderlies and people came in and they threw my wife out of the room. Um, and it's very disturbing because I was trying to tell them and I wanted to tell my wife what had happened to me. So when um, I passed my wife in the hall on the gurney on the way to the surgery, um, I said, everything's going to be great. And she just started bawling because she thought like that was like a dying man, you know. <laughs> you know? The strange thing about the experience is the memory hasn't dulled at all. It's real intense. Um, and I don't know, it stays intense. And I believe that one of the reasons that God gave me this experience so that I would have an opportunity to share it with someone, I don't know who, I never know who, but I would have the opportunity to share it with somebody so that it could be of help to them. A random survey reveals that many people do not believe in a true heaven and hell. Many of those who do believe these places exist have different ideas of how a person gets to one place or the other. I don't believe there's a hell. I do believe there's a heaven. Um, somehow there has to be more to this existence than just, you know, your short period of time on the earth. It's got to be something, something following it.
I believe that everyone will pay for what they do in life. Uh, I don't believe necessarily by what the Bible says about hell being a fiery inferno. I believe that hell is just your worst fears and everything that has that can be evil in your own perception you pay for for eternity and I also believe that heaven is where you just you could live for the rest of your life in peace as long as you love God and live for God and live by his word I do believe there is a heaven definitely a heaven I'm not sure so much about the hell how you explain hell however yes heaven yes I don't think it's necessary that you attend church to go to heaven or that you believe in the Bible, but just leave a good life. I think uh, hell is reserved for just a few really bad people, uh, maybe somebody who might commit murder intentionally. Probably murder is about the only thing I would think you would probably end up in hell for. I'm not really sure what, really what would define you to go to hell or why you would go to heaven. I, I really wouldn't. I think there's probably not either a heaven or hell, just a afterlife. I don't know exactly what it is, but uh, I think I think there. I'm not sure what there is, but um, I think there's just sort of a middle, like a limbo or a purgatory, where everybody goes. That's neither really comfortable or really uh, traumatic. I believe that everybody, number one, in their own mind thinks of a heaven and hell, and heaven is what makes them the happiest, what they're looking forward to in the future, and what they strongly believe by their belief, whether it be God or some other deity or some other entity, that heaven does exist, and that's what they work for in life. My daughter is a proclaimed atheist, but somewhere in the back of her mind, she knows that there is, in her mind, what she wants out of the final lifetime. And to me, that is all it requires. A deity is not required. I believe in my kind of belief, which is more of a metaphysical belief. I believe whatever, how you feel on earth and how you view heaven, what it is, that that's what you're, it's your own conception. So it becomes that way when you die. So if you believe that there's a God source in you and that you're basically a good person and you're a happy person, then that's what happens to you after you go but I don't believe that you're penalized and that you go to some place full of fire if you didn't live your life the way organized religion thinks you should. Many people are trying to dilute the message of hell, the message of heaven, saying that neither of these worlds exist. Why not eat, drink, and be merry? If there is no accountability, then there is no sin. And if there's no sin, Christ died in vain. And if Christ died in vain, what do we need God for? This is the new philosophy of the new age, that there is no hell. It is the hope of most people, there is no hell. On the other hand, people are going to visit our loved ones in the hospital with a new message of a new age that is the exact opposite. It's called the the religion of endy ears, the religion of near-death experiences. Look, I went to heaven, they tell the patient that's dying, and I saw the light, and I came back, all is well. There is no accountability, there is no hell. Heaven's gates are open wide for everyone who dies. Look at me, I'm an atheist, I'm here. You don't have to worry. Death is nothing to be feared. I'm going to stay with you. Your family's too afraid to stay with you while you're dying, but I'm not. Let me hold your hand. Let me tell you about this glorious thing that's coming to get you, this beautiful light at the end of the tunnel where there is no worry, no loss, only gain. You're acceptable as you are. There is no heaven. There is no hell. It is eternity for all. And this is the new age called the Omega faith, where everybody goes to heaven. And this is the group that's coming into our hospitals now, counseling the dying instead of our church groups, counseling the dying. The dying is the most neglected ministry of all ministries we have. Nobody wants it. Everybody's afraid of the dying patient. And the dying patient wants to know what dying is all about. Does it hurt? 
Is there life after death? Is there heaven after hell? How can I make sure that I'm going to get to heaven? And you can tell them. It's a free gift. You can tell them how to get it. But if we don't defend ourselves against the Omega faith and these people infiltrating the hospitals now with a faith that's deadly, nothing, that the world is nothing, then we're going to lose our own Christianity. The, the patient will die naked without any faith at all. We'd like to introduce uh, the case of Dr. Whitaker, who's still in practice, an atheist at the time, had nothing to do with God. Uh, but there's a situation that occurred that changed his life, and we'd like you to experience it with him. It was February of 1975. At that time, I was an alcoholic out of control. Uh, I was also using uh, recreation drugs, but primarily alcohol was my drug of choice. And uh, I totally was out of control. And I had a lot of friends in the entertainment business, and Hoyt Axton happened to be one of them. Ringo Starr and a bunch of people, and so they were having a TV special on the West Coast. And so Hoyt had called me and asked me if I would like to go uh, or come out. And I told him, yeah, I'd really love to, because I knew there was going to be a lot of booze, I knew there was going to be partying, and while they were doing their special, uh, I was doing my thing. And so after about three or four days out there, I became ill. And uh, by ill, I mean I, I had a severe pain in my abdomen. I flew into Oklahoma City and uh, called a senator friend of mine and told him I had to have a car because I was ill, I was sick. So they sent a car and they took me home and I checked into the hospital at Wadley Hospital in Texarkana in February of 1975. I checked in with electrolytes, which means my potassium, my chlorides and various chemicals were so far out of balance that uh, they had to give me IVs to build me up. Now, at that time in my life, I was an atheist. Uh, I was a hardcore atheist and uh, was living for myself. Uh, atheists uh, are self-centered and they live for themselves. And this is where I found myself in 1975 in the hospital. And they took three days and then they operated me. And when they operated me, I found myself in intensive care I woke up on a respirator, which means they were breathing for me. Uh, I was, I couldn't speak, but I, you know, and I had been laying there in a coma, and I had heard these people talk about how sick I was, and how I was going to die, and how I wouldn't get out of the hospital. And at that time, my hair was very, very long, because I, uh, I just wore my hair long, and I heard one guy say, my, his hair is long, and another guy said, not nearly as long as it's going to be before he gets out of here. And a third voice said, he's not going to get out of here, he's going to die. And after three days, I could breathe on my own. And I remember my doctor, my surgeon, a guy by the name of Donald Duncan, he told me, he says, Don, if you have anything to get right, if you have anything to get signed, you get it done, because we're not sure. We're not sure how long you have. So I knew, see, I had a condition that was called acute hemorrhagic necrotic pancreatitis. You don't live with this disease. Now, you can live with pancreatitis. You can even live with acute pancreatitis. But you do not live with acute hemorrhagic necrotic pancreatitis. Duncan had told my two sons that I would be dead before morning. They didn't expect me to survive. And, uh, you know, I'm laying there. Now, I, I'm a professed atheist, and when I say a professed atheist, I didn't believe in God. Uh, I believed in the power of the universe because I'd seen it. You know, I'd seen it, life and death. As a physician, I dealt with life and death. I, I believed in something, but don't talk to me about God, and surely don't talk to me about a resurrection or a virgin birth or this type of thing, because I am in research science. PhDs in research science, the majority of them do not believe in God. They do not believe in a supreme being. They believe, that they're beginning now to believe that there is order in the universe uh, because as we get farther and farther along, uh, we see the order. But I was an atheist. Now see, it's very easy to be an atheist when you're successful, 
You have worked your way from Oklahoma welfare to being one of the most powerful men in your part of the country, one of the most powerful men in the state of Oklahoma in relationship to political. It's very easy to be an atheist when you have done all of that. Man can sit back and say, I don't need God. What is God? But it's very difficult to be an atheist when you're laying on your deathbed because you begin to think, what if these people are right? See, there'd been one man by the name of Ron Short that had stood between me and the gates of hell. One man that had witnessed to me about the love of Jesus for five years before I became ill. One man. And, you know, I would debate him, and I liked him because he did what he said he was going to do. I mean, he was the only one that I saw that professed to be Christian that lived what he said he was going to do. Uh, and so I, I really respected him. I didn't believe what he said, but I respected him. But when I'm laying on my deathbed and knowing that I'm going to die, guess who I thought about? I thought about, what if Ron is right? What if there is a heaven and a hell? And so the most immediately, immediately, the most pressing thought in my mind is, how do I get saved? What is saved? What is saved? How do I get saved? And so I sent them for Ron Short. I wanted him to come down uh, because I wanted him to do ever what he had to do. I had no idea. How can a man hanging on a tree in Israel 2,000 years ago, what is that to me? But I knew that he had something that I had to have. And that night, see, I had him go for Ron, but Ron wasn't home. Ron was in Alabama. And so I had him go and send for Ron. And that night was the longest night that I've ever had in my entire life, before or since. And that night is as I would be laying there in bed. As I'm laying there in bed, I would begin to fade away. I would begin to fade away, and as I would fade away, I would begin to go down. It, now, it was like darkness. It was like, it was so, so dark. It was like the very darkness just penetrated into your very, very being. And as I left, and I can tell you I left my body because I remember when I came back into my body. You know, I don't know where I was out of my body. Now, there are people that talk about the, the, a light. There are people that talk about floating above. There are t people that talk about a feeling of warmth and love. I didn't feel any of that. I felt none of that. I felt untold terror, untold terror, because I knew that if I ever went all the way, if I slipped all the way, I would never get back. Now, in my beings of beings, I knew that. And so I fought all night long. They told me later on, I not only pulled the mattress cover off of the mattress, I pulled the mattress up on me because I had to stay. I had to wait. I had to wait till Ron got there. Whatever he had to do, I had to wait. But I would, again, and then I would leave and I would, I would be going down like a deep, deep, dark terror. Now, my, my skin began to get cold. Now, it's not like cold when you walk out into the air. It's like bone, bone chilling cold in my lower extremities. And you can feel the coldness begin to come up the legs. And again, I would begin to leave. Now, and I would be in that darkness and I'd be in that void. Uh, and I remember one time entering back in my body because when I entered my body, it was like, just like that. I felt my body thud, my physical body thud when I entered back in. Now, I, believe me, believe me, that is the most horrifying, terrifying experience that I've ever encountered. And I fought all night long. And the next morning, somewhere 9.30, 10 o'clock, in came Ron. 
And Ron came in and he says, Dr. Whitaker, what do they say is your chances? I said, Ron, they tell me I have none. He says, now's the time. And I said, you're right. I mean, I'd cursed him, I'd spit at him, but now was the time because I had to have whatever he had because I had a short period of time on earth and I didn't know, have any idea when I might make that trip and go all the way. At that time, Ron led me simply in the sinner's prayer. Now, I had no idea what the sinner's prayer was, but I, see, I trusted Ron, but he led me in the sinner's prayer and told me that Jesus had died for my sins. He had died for the sins of the world. Uh, I didn't quite understand that, but I knew, you know, he showed me in the Word of God where it said that. Now, you have to understand, I'm a man of books. I've spent the big part of my life, 25, 26 years of my life, in books, uh, in, you know, all types of scientific books. Uh, chemistry, like I said, degree in chemistry, advanced degrees, uh, all the way out to the medicine doctor to practice medicine, all of these degrees. So he told me, and I believed him because it's in this book, and it was a new book unto me, and it was called the Bible. And so I led, I, 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 I let Ron lead me in the sinner's prayer, and I, I said the sinner's prayer after him, and I can tell you one thing. There was a peace that came over me like I had never known. I'd search for that peace. I'd search for it in the bottles, alcohol. I'd search for it in needles. I'd search for it in drugs. I'd search for it with women. I'd search for it in all types of places. But there was no peace in my life. But once I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I was no longer afraid. I still believed I was going to die because I knew the condition I had is that you do not survive it. I knew that. I'm a physician. I knew what I had, you did not survive. And he shows me in the Word of God, it says, these signs shall follow those that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I walk around on planet Earth this day taking no insulin, taking no enzymes, eating whatsoever that I might, and God produces in my body every day the correct material for me to function without having to take medication. You know, when you see blind eyes open, you see the cripples walk, you see the leopards cleanse, and you see them with your own eyes, you know, you, you see that, then it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that, you know, the Bible is true. How can the various stages of hell have different aspects to them? Well, the Bible doesn't say it's all fire. If you look at different places, it's cast out, separated from God, total darkness, um, where the worm cannot die. Most of it is flame. But there are some that can't visualize this, like Rodaniah that we'll introduce, and Whitaker. Dr. Whitaker, seeing the angel of light can be deceptive in some cases. For instance, uh, 2 Corinthians 11:14, 14, even Satan can change himself into an angel of light and deceive many. Which light did they see at the end of the tunnel? Especially if it was someone that uh, didn't think they deserved to be in heaven. Those things occur. Strangely enough, the opposite does not occur. Those that saw themselves in hell knew exactly they, where they belong. They never questioned why they were put there. In fact, uh, Christ talked about this himself in Matthew 25. He says, if Satan cast out Satan and sent hell as an imaginary picture, how would his kingdom stand? How would it hold together? No, impossible, but no. As an angel of light, Satan can deceive many. But this variation that they see in hell, whether it's total darkness uh, or whether it's the fire, it's a place that they never want to visit again. This brings us to the case of Dr. Rodanaya, George Rodanaya, a young Russian fellow and very intelligent, became a PhD and MD, but before that had trouble with the KGB and couldn't get out of Russia. In fact, when he tried to get out of Russia, he was purposely run down by the KGB 
overriding the sidewalk and running over him. And this is how his accident started and his story started. As a psychiatrist, as a neuropathologist, for me, God never existed. I never believed in God. I never believed in the uh, Bible. I never thought about uh, God or Bible or, or divinity. In 1976, I was 20 when I was uh, already a doctor working in Georgia. I uh, met a lady from uh, Texas and uh, I tried to leave the country many times but I didn't have such a help. This lady tried to help me and uh, I became in big trouble with KGB. Uh, because my work, I worked on adenosine triphosphate, it's a neurotransmitter in our brain and with the conjunction of uh, oxytocin I discovered several things and I was a scientist and uh, uh, KGB didn't want me to go, so that's why uh, they decided to kill me. That's how I got into another dimension of my life. I was standing on, uh, on the sidewalk, uh, ready to depart to uh, New York, uh, waiting for a cab, uh, when a car ran on the sidewalk and uh, hit me. I flew 10 meters and I fell and then run. the car runs over me. Uh, my friends and relatives took me to hospital and uh, the hospital uh, staff, friends of mine and uh, two other professors uh, constated or declared me dead. They put me in morgue in a freezer and uh, uh, three days later they took me out on Monday, it was Friday night, and on Monday morning they began my autopsy. And uh, these three days being out of my body, seeing everything what was happening around, seeing myself, my body, seeing my birth, uh, my parents, um, my wife, uh, my child, my friends, um, I saw their thoughts, I saw what they were thinking, how, they, uh, how, how, how their thought moved from one to another dimension. It was an incredible experience. I was in darkness, in total darkness, and this darkness was pressing. This darkness existed not beyond, but existed within. What I want to say is that darkness was pressing, and I was in the middle of despair. And, um, and I didn't understand why and how this darkness existed. Where was I? And uh, I understood I didn't have a body because I didn't feel it. But then I thought about light. I, I, I went through that little hall into light. Uh, but light was more powerful, more burning. I mean, you cannot compare it to anything. In, it, no word can explain it. And, and this light was so burning and... and, and uh, um, uh, going through flesh, but I didn't have a body. That was the most, uh, most interesting part. And I was scared of that light. I thought, where is that hole to darkness, go to shade, to save myself from this light. What is that light? I don't know. I mean, it, it can be called light of God. It can be called light of life. But light is light and darkness is darkness. And then as a psychiatrist and scientist, I didn't uh, think about that. Only thing was that I was in light. We were not raised in God. We were, you know, Soviet Union. We didn't go to church. We didn't have, there were people who went, but they were some kind of limited people, we thought. I mean, we thought they didn't know better that there is no God. But uh, during that three days being in morgue, in freezer, changed all my life. To begin the autopsy, they, uh, they began to cut my chest, that, that was the first incision. Then I opened eyes. So when I opened eyes and he saw the pupils were convulsing, uh, um, becoming smaller, to say simply, um, he, he saw that it was uh, reacting on, on light. It means it's life. And uh, they put me back uh, into hospital and began resuscitation. My lungs were collapsed for many time. I mean, long time. I was on a respirator for 90 days. I mean, it's not, it's not that it's happened fast, but the life came back 
and what they discovered was uh, that life was there during the autopsy, but it wasn't that all organs worked. I mean, it was hard work for nine months being under uh, the recovery. Um, uh, it, it didn't happen immediately. I mean, the life was there, but it doesn't mean that I could survive if not doctors who helped me uh, to regenerate my uh, health and organs. When I came to life back, you know, a lot of different experiences happened and I, I experienced a lot of uh, rejection, a lot of uh, fight uh, with, the, with the reality of others, but nothing could change my mind. I knew uh, my destination, I knew my way, and I decided to leave the country. And again, this lady from Longview, Texas, helped me to move uh, to United States. And uh, we came to Texas, and we continue to live in Texas still. Sometimes things are beyond our grasp. But I don't try to explain it all, because I know uh, and I believe uh, that God knows better, and uh, I believe that I don't need to be explained. And why it was shown to me, and why it's me chosen to be, it wasn't question, and I don't care about that, honestly. I care that it was. I deeply believe in God of love, and God is love. And I believe that God, um, God created everything for betterness and for incredible, incredible future, uh, if we don't ruin it. A very unusual, extraordinary case. And now we want to take you to a practical experiment. We said we'd show you how to start somebody's heart up again, start their breathing up again, and you do it with your bare hands. So immediately on the floor, we'll assume this is the floor, you see if she's all right. Hey, lady, did you faint? Maybe she's intoxicated she'll talk to you or just bumped her head from a faint but then you immediately look feel and listen to see if she's breathing whether the chest is moving nostrils moving air exchange felt if not you immediately forget the heart you go to the airway and you unobstruct the airway by lifting the chin pointing to the ceiling this straightens out the windpipe then you close her nostrils so your air in her mouth will inflate her lungs. And you give her two quick breaths. And see if this should rise. And if it rises, it's an unobstructed airway. If it's still obstructed, you go back and give two more breaths and reach down and unobstruct the airway. If her heart is not breathing, and you determine that by not listening with your ear, but feeling on the carotid pulse on either side of the Adam's apple, you'll feel boom, 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 boom. If you do not feel that, after the two quick breaths, two inches above the xiphoid, the lower part of the breastbone, you implant the heel of one hand, supplement it with the heel of the other, and push your weight down on her. We know, and this is the important thing, this is a critical moment in life. If we can catch people before they die, before they drop dead, like you and I, we're alive, we have a choice, and give them the option of accepting Jesus Christ as a personal savior, then they can't lose whether they live or die. That's with them forever. And when they die like this, we don't have to question where they went. And the preacher will be right. She went to heaven to be with God. But those that die on the street, where did they go? And is it the minister's fault or your fault and mine? Because we did not approach them with the gospel, which is a free gift to anyone that wants it. Now we have several things in common I'd like to talk to you about with these other cases. All of these hell-like cases had one thing in common. Surprise, they didn't know there was such a place. Will you find it a surprise? Will I find it a surprise? Or will we be prepared? Hell is nothing new. It's been there. 
It's just something discovered by some people that died and came back, and they want to tell you about it. And I experienced um, what is uh, love, uh, what is uh, faith, what is hope, and all these three as a wisdom of God. The prayer of faith, the prayer of salvation, is not some just little prayer. It's the only way to the Father, and that's the only way. Now, all of these people that in the New Age movement that believe that everybody's going to heaven, that you can worship anything, you worship a flea, you can, you can squeeze a tree, uh, you can worship a crystal, you can worship the star, I got news for them. They're not, you know, they're not going uh, unless they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because the Word says the only way to the Father is through the Son. Don't go to hell. Please, I beg you, don't go to hell. It was not prepared for you. If you're saved, you're saved today. If you accept Jesus. Do not put off for tomorrow anything. Because you might die this very moment, this very night. It's the best sight ever happened to any life. You can feel Jesus' presence with you like today in this place in this time. It's not God's will that people perish. I didn't know this. I didn't know the love of God. All I knew was hatred and violence and abuse. But there's one that cares, and his name is Jesus. And who is the Son? He's the Word made flesh and came and dwelt amongst men. The Word is the way to the Father. Make a choice. Not tomorrow, not tonight. Make a choice right now. Are you going to give your heart over to Jesus, or are you not? If you want to, to have life hereafter, you better accept Jesus. Friends, you've heard the evidence. This is as close as you're going to get to making a decision. Is there life after death? Are these people that we've presented to you turning their lives upside down because there is a heaven and there is a hell? Have you made a decision in your own life? Do you know if you die tonight, you would be with God in heaven tomorrow? If you're not sure, see the number at the bottom of your screen. We have counselors. And remember the adage from Revelation 3.15. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. God is knocking right now. If you hear me, open the door and I will come in. I will come in, not might come in, and fellowship with you and you with me. It means you come dirty just like you are. He'll fellowship and tell you how to clean up your life. And meanwhile, in exchange, give you this free gift of eternal life with Jesus Christ because you're one of his. You're now a Christian. Thank you, friends, for coming tonight. Good night.